Hello and welcome to this BLSI Spotlight. Today I'm going to be talking to Dorothy Byrne. Dorothy has been Head of News and Current Affairs at Channel 4 for 20 years. and She's one of the most experienced broadcast journalists in the country. As we all grapple with coronavirus and it affects society in so many different ways, I wanted to ask her what challenges it poses for the broadcast news media, for journalists generally, both practically in terms of how they gather the news during these difficult times of social distancing and lockdown, and also in principle, what is the role of the news media during this time? How much are they meant to hold government to account? How much are they meant to inform us? How much are they meant to act as morale boosters or, or, or carry out a public service for us? And what is that public service exactly? I hope you enjoy the discussion. Dorothy Byrne, welcome. It's really kind of you to spend some time chatting about this subject. Um, mm -hmm. Coronavirus has upended life for all of us, but uh, for in, you in the news media, it poses very specific challenges. I mean, I'd be interested to know what are the biggest challenges, both practically and in terms of how you approach this as a story to cover? The practical challenges for covering coronavirus have been immense. We have not been with people, our studio full of people. We've had to keep the number of people in the newsroom to the smallest possible number, often about 15 a day for safety, and they have to socially distance themselves. The crews, when they go out, have to be very careful that they don't themselves get infected, but also that they don't infect the people who they are going to see. <clears throat> so people will have seen on television these very long sound booms that we've been using. A lot of the time, it's not safe to go into somebody's house or, for example, to go into a care home. So you have to get those people to film themselves. And obviously you have to interview people in their own homes. You can't ask them to come to the studio. Our marvelous uh, director, Martin Collett, has found brilliant ways of our presenters actually presenting the news from their homes. They, their living rooms are set up as little studios, which is a bit annoying for their families because the living room now isn't the living room, it's a sort of mini studio. And what's been extraordinary is that I don't think we've had one complaint from a member of the public saying, I couldn't see properly or I couldn't hear properly. You know, it, technologically, we have made extraordinary advances. And I think that we have probably all in news learned a great deal that is going to be of use to us in the future about innovative ways in which you can make television news. In terms of the ethics of covering this, we've had to think in a very responsible way about how we cover something so terrifying, genuinely frightening to the more than 60 million people who live in the UK. We can't shy away from the truth, but we also have to be responsible about the tone in which we cover things. Uh, we have to be very sensitive about covering the deaths of people and ensuring that we um, only show um, or describe details of how people died uh, with the permission and cooperation of their loved ones. What has been very interesting is that so many people have wanted us to tell the truth about how their father, who was a doctor, died because he got infected, etc. We've um, had to strike a balance between 
covering what the government says and the government is giving people important information about why it's essential to uh, for people to remain at home and at the same time we've had to challenge a lot of what the government has said and when i say we i mean all journalists and i think what's been very interesting to me also in my role as chair of the ethical journalism network which is a small charity which upholds ethical journalistic standards is we've seen some really outstanding and ethical journalism uh, from people across the board it's been very interesting to me that conservative newspapers have uh, really done very very strong journalism in finding out what is really happening and comparing that with what the government has been telling people there's also been widespread use of whistleblowers and obviously when you have any whistleblower you have to check that that person is really who they say they are and i think there's been one instance in this where another broadcaster didn't check that and made a mistake but even when we're in such a hurry we have to check that the whistleblower is who they say they are but what has been extraordinary in this is that the 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 very um high caliber of many whistleblowers they have been people in very senior positions in hospitals health authorities um medicine in general uh and and fundamentally, they have used journalists to reveal the truth about what has really happened. And then journalists have been telling that back to the government and saying, you are saying the following is true. You may well believe that, but we are hearing between us from hundreds of health and social care uh workers and executives that actually the truth is something different and presumably when you're navigating that boundary between you know, conveying the information the government wants to be conveyed which obviously the news media do but also then perhaps going into areas that they feel less comfortable about for example they may you know the government may perhaps reasonably say one of the things we want to do is we, we want to make sure we don't panic people unnecessarily or alarm people unnecessarily but that comes into conflict when journalists are finding things that are alarming and need to be reported on how you know is there a does the journalistic mission always take priority in that or does that have to be balanced what's essential is that the public must trust journalists because if the public don't trust what journalists are telling them that's when they will get alarmed that's when they will panic and i believe that by challenging what officials and government statements have been saying and showing our viewers we are not just believing what officialdom is saying we are raising the levels of trust among the public and thereby reducing panic and alarm in fact what's been very interesting is how trust in television journalism has risen during this crisis Trust in TV journalism in the UK is very high traditionally, and that's because the public know that we are regulated by, under regulation, we have to be fair, accurate, and truly really impartial. We're not perfect, but the public know that we are held to certain principles. 
the level of trust in the BBC TV and Channel 4 TV news has risen to 83%, which is very, very high. And for ITV, it's 82%, just behind. And for uh, Sky News, it's just a little bit behind that. So actually, we have managed through careful, responsible, but challenging journalism to make the public feel that they can trust us. Another thing that has been very interesting in this is that just before all this happened, there was some talk in the media that our form of television was outdated and we should move to a system more like the American system where TV news can be partial and opinionated. I haven't heard anybody in all of this uh, say that at all. And also prior to this, some people were saying mainstream TV news is now irrelevant. Politicians don't need to appear on it. They can just appear on social media. Who needs mainstream TV news? Well, here we are in the biggest crisis in our lifetimes for most of us, because most of us didn't live through the Second World War. And our politicians are putting being on TV and being challenged on TV at length right at the very center of their political policy. Every day they are there um, on TV answering detailed questions. So, you know, I think we've been very lucky in this country uh, to have this system. When you look at what's happening in America, where in the United States of America, we are seeing uh, members of the public come out in the streets and protest and say, it's all a lie, we don't need to stay at home, this is all rubbish. I would say that's probably because they no longer believe their TV news. And in this country, people believe their television news. So if we say, the government says that the only way at this moment to deal with this pandemic is for most people to stay at home. And we as journalists have reviewed that information, we've challenged that information, and generally speaking, that appears to be true, then, then people believe it. Because we're not, they know we are not just the mouthpiece of the government. It's almost that uh, point, I guess, that in serious times, you, you almost go back to first principles, you know, and, and people really do need to, or they want to rely on and trust their television news. And, you know, it seems as if it's panning out that way. Um, some people perhaps might say that in a situation where the, the country is facing a crisis, mm. that um, the journalists need to be on team. You know, we should be all be going in the same direction together. And the government, if the government says we should be going in this direction, it's the journalist's job to just go along with that. I think you've covered the fact that it's also that isn't journalism. Job. No, that's and just, if we all said the same thing, a lot of people wouldn't believe anything. It's because we're not saying the same thing as the government, and also because all different forms of the media are raising different points. So the Daily Mail is raising particular points about care homes. The Sunday Times is raising particular points about how ready was this government, how, uh, how well prepared were they when they were given warnings early on. Channel 4, we are asking similar but different questions and it's because people hear a plurality of voices also that they can trust and I think that's the other point that I've heard people in the past say 
well, really, we only need BBC TV if we're going to have, you know, public service news. But if you only have one public service news, um, however good it was, a lot of people would think, well, they're the mouthpiece of the government. But we've got BBC, Channel 4, ITV, Channel 5 and Sky all saying, um, all analysing what is happening now in different ways. And that is what brings credibility. Yeah, so really that separation between you know, the, the, the media and the government is crucial to ensuring trust. And otherwise, you know, you end up like China or, or, or uh, somewhere where you can't trust the, what you're being told. Yeah, and holding, do you know, it's not just that we've been holding the government to account as journalists. We've actually been informing the government that what they seem to be being told by officials isn't the case. So on several occasions when officials or government spokesmen have said, this is what's happening in care homes, journalists have said, no, it isn't. That isn't what's happening. And then the government has had to change its policies because of what journalists were telling them. You know, when journalists revealed that in various places in this country, people were being told who ran care homes that hospitals, they shouldn't send any of their people to hospital. I, I don't think the government knew that. We told the government that. And the government said, but that's not our policy. So I honestly think we have helped the government a lot in this emergency. I don't expect them to know absolutely everything. But out there, there are thousands and thousands of journalists finding things out. And that has been of great value to the public. Um, the um, what, one one aspect of this that I think hasn't been massively analysed, but is that because of the nature of this crisis and how widespread it is, governments have been taking an awful lot of power onto themselves and, yes. and exercising, in, you know, exercising that power in a fairly peremptory way when they need to. Um, does that make it all the more necessary for, you know, that they be scrutinised? You know, one thinks of President Obama's former chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I know not so much in this country, but I've seen reporting in America um, about how both sides of the political divide there are trying to use this to push different parts of their agenda that are not directly related to coronavirus. So is this a time when actually governments need more scrutiny than, than, than normal even? Well, there are uh, absolutely because the government is taking great power to itself. And on the whole, the British public have realised, yes, they probably have to do that at this moment. But the fear is always, are they going to hang on to those powers? And I think we're only at the beginning of seeing what a major issue this is going to be because what's about to happen we believe is that there is potentially going to be a telephone app or telephone apps but it might just be one telephone app and it tracks people and millions and millions and millions of us are going to be asked to agree that we be tracked. Now, that is not something that if you had said in January, the British people would ever go along with, that anybody would believe you would go along with. If it is necessary to do that during this period of time, how long will it be necessary? Because this problem isn't going to go away, is it? I mean, some people say we might have a vaccine in a year. Some people say in 18 months. Some people say we may never have a vaccine. So does that mean that we're all going to accept that, you know, Big Brother 
can track us all using our mobile phones ad infinitum. I, I mean, that is a very frightening thought. So, and we are going to, as journalists, have to bring all those issues into public debate. And some people might then say, well, you should just be welcoming this app because it will save lives. And yes, it will save lives, we hope, but it also has downsides. And it's for us as journalists to point out those downsides to people, even if some people think we should just not think about privacy at all. You referred earlier to um, the demonstrations in America, people you know, sort of cavilling against the lockdown restrictions and so on. I mean, just generally, that does raise the question of what, how do you weigh up um, what weight to give to minority viewpoints in, in a situation like this? So it could be minority viewpoints from the, you know, for example, people who think the lockdown should end much sooner than the majority of scientists yes. seem to be uh, seem to be saying, or even scientists who have a very different um, prognosis for how they think infection rates will pan out, etc. It's it's you know there's a lot of people looking at this, studying it, coming at it from different angles, mm. and again, it's quite a responsibility on the news to to say, well, this is the one we think is you know we should give more airtime to than something else, and and this one shouldn't be on the air at all because it's a crazy conspiracy theory or whatever. How do you how do you balance that? Well, that is uh, that's what we get paid to do and that's why years of training um, is helpful. First of all we do have to say there are some absolutely mad ideas and I'm not I didn't go into journalism to promulgate mad ideas and you know the idea that this all comes from 5G is there is, there is no foundation or basis for that view. But the view that, that may at this moment appear to be the minority view from a few scientists might prove to be actually right in the long run. So we've got to use our judgment to determine uh, how much of these other views should people hear alongside giving them the daily information that they need? And I think that if significant and informed groups of scientists say, uh, actually, we don't think that this modeling is quite right, we should be covering that. Um, some public health experts, the leading, leading public health experts in our country have said public health experts are not being sufficiently consulted in making the decisions. Now that is a very important view that we should be promulgating and telling people about. So I've heard people, and to an extent the government has referred to the science. That, no, there isn't such a thing as the science. There are different scientists who hold different opinions. And what we've got to do as journalists is use our experience and intelligence to work out which groups of scientists appear to have legitimate other views because there there can be no one science i think that some journalism has been hampered by the fact that too few journalists have scientific backgrounds and what this has shown to me is that we must encourage more top science graduates to go into journalism Early on, I feel I heard too many journalists just repeat the mantra, the science says this, the science says that, and rather than going, 
the majority scientific opinion at the moment is this, but a significant minority think that. I think, and you know, um, I think you're, I'm sure you're right about journalists. Most journalists, you know, myself included, come from an arts background. But I think the same criticism could be made of, of MPs and the civil service as well, potentially. Mm -hmm. There just aren't enough people from science backgrounds going into those fields. We and need, this, this has shown me that we need more politicians from scientific backgrounds, more civil servants from scientific backgrounds. In every area of public life, we need more people with really good science degrees. I mean, there seem to be so many ways this this whole crisis, health emergency, whatever you want to call it, is may change things moving forward. And that's a, that's one that you've just hit on. Are, are there other things in terms of what you do as a journalist and what news media do? Can you think? Do you see ways in which it will change how we how we handle the news going forward? You've already referred to trust, for example, earlier. Um, and yeah, you know, before coronavirus, it was pretty. You heard a lot of people say, as you as you indeed said yourself, people will say, "Oh, well, you know, mainstream media, you know, it's all you, you get everything you need off social media now." But mm -hmm. this seems to be pivoting, pivoting us back to a, an earlier time in some ways. Well, it's actually always been the case. We know from a fairly recent Reuters report that only ten percent of people actually believe news on social media. But I think people will use and trust news on social media even less. I think that the world is going to be a far more serious place for a long time. This is not going to go away. This, uh, the economic consequences will be with us for years. This virus may be with us for years. So I think that we will see news become uh, much more serious. I think we will see people value uh, and use serious news much more. We've seen a, um, the last Ofcom report, Ofcom being the TV regulator that I saw from April the 9th, showed that there was a 92% increase in television news viewing. I think people will want more informed news. I, I believe it may mean people will want fewer celebrities because who are the people that the public has come to love and admire? It's been the ordinary people of Britain. I mean, nobody's ordinary, so I hate to use that term, but um, there's actually been a bit of a reaction to celebrities. Um, not, you know, I think everybody like the Mick Jagger, Elton John and, and Lady Gaga concert, you know, I think things like that people have really valued. But for too long, we've had this thing of people asking celebrities their opinions about serious subjects. I hope that is just going to go. No offence meant to celebrities, but I, I, I honestly, I don't, we've seen too much of them. And, and I hope we'll be seeing a lot less of them. And some people have said, we don't need experts. Now, it was never quite true that Michael Gove had said precisely that we didn't need experts, but I have said that. Well, you know, if you're dying of coronavirus, <laughs> you need an expert. You don't need a celebrity. But I think also, people have seen these experts are not always right and these experts disagree with each other. So I think that um, the public has had to undergo um, an enormous education overnight about how to judge between experts. The public has had to start understanding science. Um, so I, I I think the world is going to be a more serious place and that our journalism will be reflecting that. And do you think there might be um, more slightly longer form anal analytical journalism about all this as well moving forward? I mean, I know there is you know, there's plenty of good 
current affairs documentaries and so on already but because this is so complex and so complicated and we're all getting up trying to understand this as we move forward it feels like there is room here to go back to some of the deeper analysis that maybe would have been more common 20 25 years ago yes i absolutely agree that 20 years ago there were a lot of very serious science programs on television and we've seen fewer of those and more science programs that were a mixture of science and factual entertainment and that sort of thing i think we people will go back to wanting some really strong old-fashioned science programming and you know i've complained before about the lack of big ideas on tv we'll need big ideas now and i think not only will we see more serious science programs but i think we'll probably see more serious economic programs as well i think we're all going to have to educate ourselves a lot more and that tv will be vital in doing that yeah i don't think i've ever heard so many people mention supply chains until this happened for example and now we're all becoming you know if not experts in supply chains we're realizing that they matter but we yes we people never asked themselves before how do things appear they just appeared and then in this they didn't appear and people began to ask themselves a lot of questions about where does everything come from Indeed. and funnily enough they were all worried about toilet paper being short there wasn't a toilet paper problem there was a ppe problem Yes, we're all chasing the wrong wrong fox yes. on that one, weren't we? Um, well, Dorothy, thank you so much. It's been really fascinating. And obviously there's lots more work. I think there's lots more work in the years ahead, really, in the fallout from this, I think, for your journalists. So, um, so thank you and keep up the good work. And, well, thank you very yeah. much indeed. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that talk. If you did, in fact, even if you didn't, there's lots more interesting material you can find on the BRLSI website by visiting www.brlsi.org. There you'll find a whole range of, of materials on subjects from the ancient world to uh, paleontology, natural sciences, politics, society, economics, uh, something for everyone really. So that's at www.brlsi.org. Thank you.